All right, welcome to the second and last video for chapter eight. In this part of the video, we're talking about the light dependent and light independent reactions. All right, now that we know more about how plants absorb light in that visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum, let's start to kind of put it together. Again, we have our chloroplast here. And again, we're looking at the thylakoid, the thylakoid membrane. And here is an example of one of those thylakoids. This is the thylakoid membrane. Inside, we have the lumen of the thylakoid, and the outside is the stroma, remember, which is the liquid portion within the chloroplasts. What we're going to see within the thylakoid membrane are photosystems. We're going to see photosystems two and one. Photosystem two actually comes first, and then photosystem one comes later. The reason they're numbered weird like that is because Photosystem 1 was discovered first, and then Photosystem 2 was discovered later. But when we put it all together, we realized that within photosynthesis, Photosystem 2 actually functions first, and then Photosystem 1 comes into play later. We're going to see that just like in Chapter 7 for cellular respiration and the metabolism of glucose, we're also going to have an electron transport chain in photosynthesis. And then we're going to see that there are two enzyme complexes involved that are important and embedded in the thylakoid membrane as well. One of these is called NADP reductase, shown here, and that is going to take NADP uh, plus the oxidized version and turn that into the redu uh, reduced version, NADPH, that high energy electron carrier. We also see ATP synthase again, like we did in chapter seven. We're going to use energy created by uh, an electrochemical gradient to generate ATP. Let's look at the photosystems in more detail. So we have photosystems two and one, and they both are composed of a light harvesting complex, which is shown in the purple areas. These are proteins that have pigment molecules embedded within them that can absorb the energy from light. In the center, we also have a reaction center complex, and this includes a pair of chlorophyll A molecules and something known as a primary electron acceptor. So what's going to happen is light will hit the light harvesting complex within the photosystem. And again, this whole thing is embedded in the thylakoid membrane. And the energy from the light will be passed from pigment to pigment in the photosystem until it reaches the central pair of chlorophyll A molecules. Remember earlier we said when photons hit these molecules, they can send electrons from a lower energy state to a high energy state. So when this happens, the electrons are excited and passed to a primary electron acceptor. This is a type of light-driven redox reaction. Remember that something is reduced and something is oxidized. In this case, the primary electron acceptor is reduced because it's gaining those electrons and the chlorophyll A is oxidized. So we have to replace those lost electrons from chlorophyll A and how this happens in photosystem two is from water. So the reason we need water as a reactant in photosynthesis is to replace those missing electrons and oxygen is a result of this reaction, it's a product of this reaction. If this were photosystem one, electrons will come from the electron transport chain. If we look at the light reactions in more detail, again, this is the thylakoid, and then we have the stroma out here and the lumen in here. Our photosystems are embedded within the thylakoid membrane. So earlier I mentioned light is absorbed by the pigments ultimately exciting the electrons from the chlorophyll A to the final electron acceptor here. And those missing electrons from chlorophyll A are replaced by the electrons donated from water, producing oxygen as a product. Those electrons will continue down the first electron transport chain shown here. So the electrons are first passed to plastoquinone or, C or PQ, those electrons are then passed to the cytochrome complex, and then they continue to plastocyanin. And just like we saw in chapter seven, 
as electrons are passed from protein to protein down this electron transport chain, it gives some of these proteins the ability to pump protons from the stroma into the lumen of the thylakoid. So now we have an increase in protons within the lumen. So these electrons are going to continue down and they are going to enter photosystem one where something similar happens. Photosystem one absorbs more light and the chlorophyll A, those electrons will be excited again. And those electrons will pass through the second electron transport chain. Electrons will first be passed to ferrodoxin and those electrons will be passed to NADP reductase. And the final electron acceptor in this case is NADP plus, which will accept those electrons along with the proton to generate our high energy electron carrier, NADPH. All right, so once more again, we have our photosystems two and then one. Again, remember electrons are excited from chlorophyll A and those electrons came from water. Those electrons will be passed down the electron transport chain and fill in the chlorophyll A electrons that were missing from the previous reaction. Those electrons are continually passed down to the second electron transport chain and ultimately end up on the NADPH molecule. As the electrons move through, we see that protons were pumped into the lumen and that creates that proton gradient. So there are more protons in the thylakoid space, that lumen, compared to the stroma. So these protons really want to go down their concentration gradient from high to low concentration, and they cannot pass through the membrane because they are charged. So they pass through ATP synthase, and that releases a lot of energy to power the production of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate, and that is through chemiosmosis. Remember the most common form or method of producing ATP. Since we have electron transport chains both in the chloroplast as well as in mitochondria as we saw in chapter 7, it's nice to see how they're similar. So the electron transport chain in mitochondria were found in the Christi, that inner membrane of the mitochondria. In chloroplasts it's similar because they're found in the thylakoid membrane. In both cases, during the transport of electrons down the electron transport chain, protons are being pumped from one side of the membrane to the other. In the mitochondria, they're being pumped from the matrix, from the inside of the mitochondria, to that intermembrane space, the dark gray region here. In chloroplasts, they're being pumped from the stroma, which is the space here, into the thylakoid lumen, into the dark region here. That's going to generate a high concentration of protons in this upper region here, the intermembrane space or the thylakoid lumen. And these protons really want to come back out, going down their concentration gradient. So when they're allowed to do so through ATP synthase, that will generate ATP through chemiosmosis. So all of the previous section was part of the light dependent reactions. This included the photosystems, our electron transport chains, and the generation of NADPH and ATP. These products, NADPH and ATP, will be needed for the light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle. And again, remember, even though we don't directly use light for the Calvin cycle, it cannot occur without light because of the requirements for ATP and NADPH. All right, so let's look at the light independent reactions or the Calvin cycle. There are three stages here. The first one is fixation, where I fix carbon dioxide. I take it from the air and I turn it into an organic solid carbon-based molecule. The second stage is reduction, where I'm going to take electrons from NADPH to reduce and produce a sugar, a carbon-based sugar compound. And then I have to regenerate a product, RUBP, that is continually recycled in the Calvin cycle for this to continue to happen in the stroma. It looks like I have to go through the Calvin cycle three times in order to generate one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule. So what's shown here is just one cycle, but I know to generate 1,3-GP, I 
would need to go through this three times. So let's just pretend I'm putting in one carbon dioxide for now. If I look at ribulose bisphosphate, that has five carbons, and it looks like the main enzyme that goes through the carbon fixation process is called Rubisco. So Rubisco has the ability to bind to carbon dioxide from the air and attach it to RUBP to generate a six carbon compound. So that's carbon fixation. Right after that, it breaks it in half to generate two three carbon compounds called phosphoglycerate or three PG, three phosphoglycerate. It looks like there is some um, ATP that's used up to phosphorylate both ends of this molecule. And then my reduction happens where I get electrons from NADPH and I reduce my carbon molecule into some kind of three carbon molecule, G3P. But I can't produce this unless I have more carbon dioxide coming in. So ultimately, I'm going to go through the Calvin cycle three times, putting in three carbon dioxides and getting out one G3P, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule, in order to ultimately produce glucose. So usually what happens is these are put together to produce glucose or to produce starch or to produce even cellulose for our cell walls in the plants. At the end of the cycle, I have to consistently, consistently regenerate RUBP, and that requires some more ATP. All right, and just like chapter seven, you don't have to know every single step of the Calvin cycle. I want you to know where it happens. So this is happening in the stroma, that liquid portion of the chloroplasts, what goes in and what comes out. So what goes in are our carbon dioxides, and specifically we need three carbon dioxide molecules to generate one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate product, which ultimately will be used to form glucose, or other compounds like starch or cellulose. We need to know the phases as well, or the stages. The first stage is carbon fixation, and that's completed by the enzyme Rubisco, which has the ability to take a carbon dioxide and bind it to ribulose bisphosphate. So this is five carbons and one CO2. That's one carbon. That will allow carbon fixation to happen, turning carbon dioxide into an organic carbon compound. I know the al along the way, I have some phosphorylation of my molecules or my intermediates to trap them within, within the stroma. There is a reduction that occurs, and that's why electrons from NADPH are needed. And then the regeneration of RUBP so that the cycle can continue requires part of that phosphorylation from ATP. And even though the Calvin cycle is sometimes known as the light independent reactions or the dark reactions, remember that they cannot occur without the light reactions. There's light that's needed because the light reactions are what generate these reactants, ATP and NADPH, that are required for the Calvin cycle to happen. So Rubisco, what does Rubisco stand for? The enzyme name is really ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. That's a big word. You don't have to know what it stands for. Everyone pretty much just calls it Rubisco, the enzyme that fixes carbon. So the nice thing about it is that it can fix carbon, and that's when it's acting as a carboxylase for the Calvin cycle. Unfortunately, Rubisco also binds to oxygen and can act as an oxygenase, which happens when it's going through photorespiration. So photorespiration is actually a wasteful reaction that sometimes happens when the levels of O2 are too high and the CO2 is low. So in photorespiration, you do not make sugars, but you do use up energy. Luckily, some plants, like this cactus shown here, have evolved mechanisms to reduce the chance of photorespiration since Rubisco can bind to both CO2 and O2. So we want Rubisco to bind to CO2, but unfortunately can also bind to oxygen. When it binds to CO2, that's when we get the Calvin cycle. When it binds to O2, that's when we get photorespiration, which we don't usually want in plants.
Our book doesn't really get into the details of photorespiration, so I'm going to cover it really briefly, and you'll learn more about it in the next biology course in the series. But most plants are called C3 plants, and the reason for this is because Rubisco, when it fixes carbon dioxide, one of the first products that's formed is 3-phosphoglycerate, a 3-carbon compound. In photorespiration, since Rubisco can also bind to oxygen, what happens is that Rubisco binds to oxygen instead of CO2, and that's going to produce a two-carbon compound, if you look it up on the internet, which uses oxygen and uses up sugars and ATP and releases CO2, and it does not produce more ATP or sugar for the plant. So for C3 plants, photorespiration is seen as a wasteful reaction. So most C3 plants, what happens is since Rubisco can bind to CO2 and oxygen, and this is for C3 plants, it really depends on what's more present or more prevalent in the environment. That will determine if Calvin cycle happens or photorespiration happens. Luckily, we have some plants that have adapted to their environment and can overcome this photorespiration wasteful reaction. One example is uh, known as, or these are known as C4 plants, like sugarcane. So what happens is in C4 plants, they have another set of cells called bundled sheath cells. And Rubisco is actually gonna be pushed over here. So Rubisco is found within the bundled sheath cells of these C4 plants. So when they open their stomata and CO2 comes in, it turns into a four carbon molecule first using a different set of enzymes. This four carbon molecule is shuttled into the bundle sheath cells where Rubisco is found. And now we don't have to worry about Rubisco binding to oxygen because it's in an inner layer of the plant. And now we can have the Calvin cycle happen. So in C4 plants, they separate um, the rubisco from its normal location and by doing this they reduce the chance for photorespiration happening. We also have another set of plants called CAM plants and this you don't have to know but it stands for Crassulacean Acid Metabolism and we see this in succulents like pineapples. They're pretty neat because they separate the steps of the Calvin cycle through time. So at night when it's cool and dry, they open their stomata to let CO2 in. And during the daytime when it's hot and they're closing their stomata to prevent the loss of water, that's when Rubisco comes into play to bind to carbon dioxide and allow the Calvin cycle to continue. So chapter eight from our book has a few really nice links to animations and videos that I recommend. Um, the first one is from the California Academy of Sciences that I showed you earlier in the first video. This one is a really nice way to visualize where photosynthesis happens. The second one looks at an overview of photosynthesis, including the light reactions and Calvin cycle. It's more general, but it's really good to look at to summarize your learning. And the last one is from HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and it's a really nice, more detailed review of the light reactions in Calvin cycle. So again, I recommend all of these. They're pretty good to review chapter eight. All right, and that takes us to the end of chapter eight on photosynthesis. In the next chapter, chapter nine, we're going to be talking about cell communication.